In the December of 1935, having recently returned to Pretoria from a year at the Westminster School of Art in London, the 24-year-old Alexis Preller, wide-eyed, motivated, curious, came across a group of women laborers on the northern outskirts of town, each of them turned out in dazzling traditional dress. Hammered and weighty brass rings glinted on their necks and ankles and colored beads decorated their aprons and armbands. These were Nzunza descended women of the Southern Ndebele people and their village to which a young Alexis followed them one day with its step terraces, mud huts, enclosed kraals and joyful, distinctive painted walls would become one of the artist's greatest sources of inspiration. He made his first painting of these Ndebele figures or Mapocha as they were also called in 1936. In that same year, a young photographer called Constance Stewart, another ambitious artist who had grown up in Pretoria, became drawn to the mystique of the Mapocha too. Having outgrown her Kodak box brownie and having trained in London and Munich between 1933 and 1935, Stewart turned a new roly flex on the traditional cultures of Southern Africa, and rather memorably in a straightforward and black and white style on the people of the Ndebele. She and Alexis plainly shared a passion and they were firm friends by 1938. Consequently, comparing their contemporaneous approaches to their Mapocha subject matter is particularly handy. Stewart's direct and documentary mode helps emphasize the visionary and daring way in which Prella interpreted the same theme. The Mapocha certainly became one of Prella's most iconic, spellbinding and protean motifs and dominated many of his seminal paintings. Two such examples, Grand Mapocha II and Mapocha Terrace, both breathtaking and richly symbolic, are featured in Strauss & Company's upcoming Johannesburg auction in May. Preller's most bewitching early pictures were made in the pursuit of an essential and elusive African spirit. Thanks to his early brush with the Mapocha women, he became enchanted by the Swazi in 1937, intrigued by figures in the Congo in 1939, and inspired in 1947 by Stewart's photo essay of her travels in Basutuland. After his life-affirming trip to the Seychelles at the end of 1948, however, from which he produced a group of vivid and joyful tropical pictures, his imagination inevitably returned to the rituals, the architecture, the traditional dress, and the visual spell of the Mapocha. He sensed in this ancient culture a way to develop his own mythical concept of Africa. In 1949, this came to life in a painting called The Storm, a hazy and simplified vision of a Mapocha matriarch, monumental in scale and beautifully enwrapped in a striped blanket. It was an evocative statement of things to come. Throughout 1950 and 1951, Prella fixated on the Mapocha women. Dignified, perceptive and imposing, they seemed to embody an archaic and distinctly African spirit. While this Mapocha matriarch emerged as the artist's most dominant motif at the time, it undertook continuous symbolic and poetic transformations. But the concept reached an initial apotheosis with Grand Mapocha I, as well as the gorgeous Grand Mapocha II, this sale's remarkable cover lot. While no doubt related to the storm, the figure in Grand Mapocha II now appears closer to pure icon or symbol. Faceless, distant, still and enigmatic, its traditional blanket has changed to a glorious ivory gold cloak. Surrounded by a gentle glow, moreover, the figure seems eternal and far removed from its everyday kraal. A maize cob appears on the wall behind, presumably an emblem of fertility and a mark of this matriarch's power, role and influence. Late in 1948, Prella conceived the kraal, a mad landmark multifigural and brugalesque scene based rather surprisingly on a traditional Ndebele village. In search of a distinctly African iconography, the work included a disparate collection of references from the continent. A slit drum, a marabou stalk, a baga carving, to name a few. With its lapas, decorative walls and human action, the kraal became a precursor to a small group of Mapocha village settings executed in the early 1950s. These scenes were usually easy enough to read. With husbands out at work, the women swathed in bright blankets, kneeling on woven mats or straight-backed and seated, chat and get on with domestic chores. While the figures were notably stylized and the palette pleasingly vivid, the scenes were rooted in routine and reality, and not too far removed from one of Stewart's documentary photographs. In comparison, however, the breathtaking Mapocha Terrace, 
while following a similar theme, strikes a different note entirely. First of all, the celestial atmosphere is set by the golden and blush light that bathes the ledges, walls, and the shallow steps. Secondly, the three Mapocha women, calm, knowing, and slow moving, with their small ovoid heads and resplendent robes, evoke a sense of awe and timelessness. In Prella's imagination, these women had transcended the humdrum and appeared to him as prophetesses or devotees, moving quietly through a sacred space. Most importantly, they seem to embody and safeguard their ancient traditions. In this context, the familiar and decorative wall paintings take on extra meaning. The colorful designs symbolize the recording of history and custom. While the patterns fade away with seasonal rains, they are restored and brightened again by the women. The walls thus become beautiful palimpsests of an archaic African civilization, and the women its scribes and custodians. <laughs>